Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry for the delay. My internet just failed moments before and it uh, rebooted. So I think we're okay now. Um, with your permission, we'll record this uh, talk and uh, post it. Is that yeah. okay, Jeremy? Thank you. Yeah. So um, it's our pleasure today at this CDL meeting to have guest speaker uh, Jeremy Clark, who's going to be talking about uh, blockchains. Um, uh, Jeremy and I are both members of the Scantegrity Voting Project and some other voting pro work after that. Um, so uh, let's get going. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Alan, and thanks for. Uh posting me uh first off you can see my screen and everything you can hear me i hear no complaints so i assume that everything's good i, I see everything in here you fine okay perfect okay so i'm going to talk about a paper it's a couple years old now uh and at the time we felt it was a really important issue to raise awareness of and i'm happy to report that in the last two years this issue has really become the at the forefront of a lot of people's minds uh, when designing blockchain systems. And so uh, I, I thought it'd be nice to present it again a couple of years later, and I can uh, work in some of the more recent uh, research that's been done in this area. So uh, just about me, Alan mentioned it a, a little bit, but I'm at Concordia University in Montreal, and I've worked on blockchain technology for about 10 years. And before uh, working on blockchain, I worked on voting, verifiable voting uh, with Alan and others. And I'll just acknowledge some of the uh, research funding partners that we have at our lab at Concordia. Okay, uh, so let's just start with a couple of stories. Okay, I'll tell you a couple of stories. So uh, the first story starts in 2017. And back in 2017, uh, in blockchain, particularly on the blockchain Ethereum, uh, there was a lot of interest in these things called ICOs. So ICO stands for Initial Coin Offering. And the idea is that someone would have an idea for like some service that should be supported on Ethereum. And they would uh, design the system in such a way that you could only use it if you had a certain token. And what they would do is they would auction that token off, usually before the system was either even developed or deployed. Uh, so you buy these tokens, you're sort of speculating on the fact that, that this token will become valuable in the future because you'll need it for this service. And the reason the companies did it at the start was it was a way to raise money instead of raising money from banks or venture capitalists and, and things like that. Now, ICO tokens, uh, they were highly volatile in price and a lot of them you know, appreciated you know, two times, 10 times. And so uh, the market had became full of speculators. So there were a lot of companies doing ICOs and there were a lot of speculators. And what the speculators would try and do is they, it, it was kind of like if your favorite band, you know, they're, they're going to play a concert. And so they, they start selling tickets uh, for the concert. So what happens immediately, you know, within seconds, the concert sells out and it's usually not the fans that get the tickets. It's scalpers and the scalpers get the tickets at face value. And then they go into a secondary market and they try and sell it for a higher value. So that's the story of ICOs as well. You have these traders. They're large traders. They're trying to buy as many ICO tokens as possible. They're doing it through the Ethereum, like not through a website or something like that. They're doing it like bare metal, sending transactions on Ethereum. Uh, and once they get all of the tokens, then they'll dump them on a, a exchange service. And that's where most of the people uh, who might want the token are, uh, because it's like a web interface. It's a little easier to use. Uh, you don't have to know about the ICO auction and things like that. And often within a day or two, the price will appreciate. So the scalper makes money and then the price might crash or who knows what happens. But usually there's a little bit of a bump uh, when, when it gets pushed onto these markets. And that's what the scalpers are, are trying to do. Uh, so they're sitting in the middle. Now, the story I want to tell you is about a particular uh, company called Status. And they uh, wanted to do an ICO, but they decided that they wanted to try and make it more fair uh, than your traditional, uh, your traditional ICO. And they wanted to try and make it so that scalpers don't end up scooping up all the tokens. So they implemented two countermeasures. So the first countermeasure was they would just put a cap on the number of tokens that you could buy. And it was kind of complicated, had this sort of dynamic ceiling. You can read the paper for the details, but for now, just uh, think of it as, as a cap. So that's one basic countermeasure. 
The other thing they did is they did something that was called limiting the gas price. Now, to understand what this is, we have to talk a little bit, I think, about how Ethereum and blockchains in general work. So let's just take a quick aside into blockchains and then we'll come back to this point. So the normal way a blockchain works is uh, you have a distributed network of nodes and they're going to process computations on your behalf. And it's very similar to a cloud environment. So in a cloud environment, what you would do is you would say, give me the node that's like closest to me. I'll send the process that I want evaluated and that node will send me the result. Okay. Blockchain works a little different. What happens in blockchain is you send the method to all the nodes that you know about. Mm -hmm. It gets relayed across the network. So all the nodes end up with a copy of your method. They all also execute it. Uh, and after it's relayed to all the nodes, it sits in a pool of pending transactions. So it doesn't get evaluated right away, but there's this pool. And if you're a node on the network, you can see the pool of pending transactions as well. Then one of the nodes, which is called a miner, will take a set of pending transactions and they'll put them into a block of transactions and that, that's what will get finalized. Uh, sometimes the pool is bigger than the number of pending or than the, the amount of space that there is in a block. And so the miners are free to choose whatever transaction they want. They can choose arbitrarily. So they might choose it based on the first one they saw. Uh, often they'll choose it uh, because you can attach a fee to it and so they'll sort it by the highest fee. Uh, once they assemble a block, uh, the, the, they'll release the block and it will say, okay, the result of method X is Z and all the other nodes had recomputed method of X. And so they all agree that, yeah, Z is, is the right output of this particular method, okay? So compared to cloud, it's much more secure. You have a much higher reliability and trust because every node looked at the computation and they all agree, but it's also way slower. And as you can imagine, it's, it's uh, very expensive uh, in order to do this operation. Okay, so let's go back to uh, this limit gas price. So in Ethereum, the way they handle uh, the fact that maybe you ask all the nodes that, you know, execute an infinite loop and then you denial of service the whole, the whole network. So you have to do something about it. So what Ethereum says is you have to pay for the computation. So the more computation you do, if you loop 10 times, you're going to pay 10 times more than if you only loop once. And so they have this concept of gas. It's like a currency. It's like an internal currency. And it's basically one atomic unit of computation. So when you ask for your code to be executed, it gets compiled down to assembly language. And every assemble, assembly opcode has a particular cost in gas. Now, gas isn't real money. It's just a, 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 it's just a measure of how much computation you're using. In order to make it real money, what the person that wants the transaction executed does is they give a quote for how much real money, in this case, it's ETH or Ether, which is the internal currency of Ethereum. And it's measured in really small units of ETH called G-Way. So if you see on the slide, the G-Way, that's a really small unit of Ethereum or, or of Ether rather. Um, and so they'll quote in G-Way how much they're willing to pay. So they might say, I'm, I'm willing to pay 50 G-Way per gas and someone else might be willing to pay 100 G-Way per gas. And then when the miners look through their pool of transactions, they're going to pick the ones that, that quote the highest amount and because they'll get paid. I, I didn't make it clear, but that, that computation is paid to the miner uh, who includes your transaction in a block, okay? So what you end up with is you have this kind of auction mechanism where uh, transactions are competing with each other for inclusion uh, in the blockchain and the ones that pay the higher fee uh, tend to get included faster or quicker. They're, they're at the front of the line as far as the miners are concerned. So what uh, scalpers do is they give really high gas costs. So, they, uh, so if you're trying to buy an ICO token, you're just quoting a normal gas price, they're gonna double it and then they're gonna be prioritized by the miners. So what uh, Status did is they said, okay, we're gonna cap that as well. So we're gonna write a line of code that says, if you, try to pay more than 50 G-Way per gas, then we're just not going to accept your bid. Uh, we're going to like throw it away uh, kind of thing. Okay, so what happened? So uh, this was in June of 2017. Uh, they raised uh, 300,000 ETH, which was about $90 million. Uh, it took 16 hours. And 
of the uh, 300,000 ETH that they uh, actually took in exchange for their token, there was about another shadow 300,000 ETH of people who were trying to buy tokens, but it failed for either because it was they asked for too many tokens, so it was over the cap, or they quoted too high of a gas price. Okay, so what you ended up with is about like a 50 50 ratio between the number number of transactions that were successful. It resulted in a token purchase and the number of transactions that failed uh, either because they asked for too many tokens or because they tried to pay too much gas. Now, you might say, well, why, why were there so many failed transactions? Didn't people know better? Like, why, why didn't they play by the rules? And the answer is that uh, ICOs at this time, you know, there was an ICO every week. And so I think they just weren't paying attention because status tried to do something different than the other ICOs. The scalpers, they just, uh, they ran this script that they ran last week on last week's ICO. They just ran it against status and they didn't know that status had, had implemented all these rules and restrictions uh, around it. So uh, anyway, so it resulted in, in a bunch of failed transactions. Now, these are the miners that uh, over that window of time, that 16 hour window of time, uh, these are the miners. So the miners are usually large pools of miners and people miners could be anonymous, but the largest pools, everyone knows what they are and they know their addresses. And so you can attribute uh, different transactions to the, the miners that, that finalized those transactions. So you can see the name of some mining pools and you can see sort of uh, as a percentage, uh, how many of these ICO transactions for status uh, were, was confirmed by each miner. And if you looked at each miner, miner by miner, what you would expect to see is about, you know, they're, they're confirming about half, half of the transactions they're confirming are successful and half of them are failed. So successful is the red bar and failed transaction are the blue bar. Okay. Now this picture is a lie. Uh, so I made up one number in this picture. Uh, this picture is what we would expect to see if everything was normal, but it is not what we saw in fact. And so if you look at F2 pool, they're the third from the last, uh, you see that uh, there's, there's sort of a red bar that's about to disappear. And this was the actual pattern uh, that we saw from F2 pool. And so they only process a very small number of successful transactions relative to the number of failed transactions. So if they were to look like every other mining pool, it seems like there's some transactions that are missing here. It's weird, like there's, there's something weird that's going on. So what exactly is going on? So we, we dug into this case a bit, and this is what we found. We found that of the successful transactions, a lot of them were F2 pool transactions themselves. So F2 pool themselves were trying to buy uh, these, these tokens. And the missing transactions are Basically, transactions that were in the pool that they're censoring because they don't want those tokens to go to someone else. So they want to buy the tokens for themselves. So they're not including anybody else's attempts to buy the tokens. They're only including their own attempts to buy the token. Okay, that's what the story looks like. And uh, the failed transactions, because they don't result in a purchase, it's safe for them to process them. And in fact, one of the main reasons that they fail is because they're giving too high of a gas and F2 pool gets to keep that gas. Uh, so it's actually good for them to include these failed transactions because they make a lot of money on them. Okay, so this is an example of a miner actually not being a neutral processor of transactions, but actually meddling uh, with transactions. Uh, we also did some work to trace back the payments. So where did these tokens end up? They ended up at a bunch of addresses. And what it looked like is F2 pool took a pile of money. They split it into a bunch of different chunks and they did that because remember there's a cap. So you can only buy so many tokens from each account. So they really knew what was going on with status and they split their money up into a bunch of small chunks. And then they were able to buy the sort of the maximum uh, tokens uh, per address. Uh, but because of blockchain, it's kind of pseudo anonymous. It's not truly anonymous uh, on Ethereum anyways. Uh, you can kind of backtrack these transactions and you can get a sense. So we're inferring this. We can't say for 100%, we can't say with 100% confidence that this is what happened, but it certainly looks like uh, F2 pool. There's a lot of evidence that they sort of went in and, th and they did something shady uh, in, in terms of this, uh, this ICO. Okay, so that's one story. So let me tell you another story. 
Uh, so this story involves a really cool, exciting uh, service. Uh, it's called FOMO 3D. And what FOMO 3D is, it's actually just a game. And the way the game works is uh, there's a countdown timer. It starts at three minutes, I think. And every time someone buys a ticket, so they do that with an Ethereum transaction, it adds 30 seconds to the timer. And the money that you, you use to buy the ticket, it goes into a pot of money. And uh, if the timer ever reaches zero, then whoever bought the last ticket, uh, they're the ones that win the entire pot. Okay. Now, as an aside, this is actually really cool because uh, you have to understand that on Ethereum, you don't have any confidentiality at, at the base layer. So any kind of game that you want to design that involves secrets, like, I don't know, a card game, you have like your, your hand of cards, that's a secret from everyone else. You can't do that kind of game on Ethereum. Uh, a lot of games require randomness, like you shuffle the deck. You can't reliably shuffle cards uh, using a blockchain because it's fully deterministic. So if you don't have randomness and you don't have secrets, it's hard to design a game that's actually exciting or captivating. Uh, but this is a game that, that, that is actually pretty cool uh, that you could run on Ethereum. Now, a lot of people speculated that this game would never end. People would keep uh, triggering uh, the timer, but I'm gonna tell you the story of, of the one time that it did actually end. So what happened is, uh, so FOMO is sitting on Ethereum as its own DAP, and there's someone, I'll call them Walter, uh, and what they did is they put another contract on Ethereum, and this was a contract that basically wasted gas. It was like high computation, it didn't do anything useful, it just grind its gears you know, for as long as possible and, and tried to burn as much gas as possible. So Walter put that transaction alongside uh, the FOMO 3D. Then Walter waited till it was around three minutes uh, left on FOMO 3D, and he bought a ticket. Okay, so now he's the most, the latest ticket uh, that has been purchased. And we know that at the other, at the same time, there were other people that were trying to buy tickets as well. And if they're successful, then it's going to reset the timer and, and Walter's no longer the last ticket holder. And so he's, he's not going to win. So what Walter does is he starts spamming his uh, contracts, the ones that burn a lot of gas, and he pays a ridiculously high gas fee. So that miners will prioritize his transactions over any other transaction that's on Ethereum at the same time, including the transactions from the people who are trying to buy the next ticket. And it's kind of crazy. So this is one of the blocks in the middle of the attack. And normally blocks have like a thousand transactions, but here they only have three transactions because these three transactions like consume, like there's a certain limit to the amount of gas that you can put in a block. And this consumes like the entire blocks limit. Uh, and so, so anyway, so that's what happened. Now, eventually he won. Uh, so the timer went down to zero and there was actually someone else who seemed to have understood what was going on. They tried to buy a ticket. So you can see them calling the same contract to buy a ticket and they quoted 5,000 gas, which is like 10 times what Walter was, was trying to uh, pay. And so that, that would have been a very high priority transaction, but that person just was a little too late. Uh, they got in like one block too late. And as a result, by that time, Walter had already won. In fact, this transaction, ironically, was the one that, you know, that finalized the fact that Walter won in, in the FOMO 3D uh, DAP. Uh, the other thing that was interesting that Walter did that was kind of clever is he had this transact, th these other uh, applications that were just grinding out gas, right? And so normally they were consuming like a ton of gas, but the way he structured that contract was that contract would look first at FOMO 3D to make sure that he hadn't won already, then they would burn a lot of gas. But if they checked FOMO 3D and saw that he won, then they would stop burning gas and they would just, they would basically just return right away with consuming the minimal amount of gas. Uh, so he didn't have to pay attention to like, when do I stop spamming this contract? With transactions, he just spammed it forever, and then eventually he won, and that contract was smart enough to scale back the amount of gas it used from four million to about thirty thousand. Uh, this is the final transaction uh, that shows him, and the question that you're all probably wondering is how much money did he win? How much money was in the pot? And so it was about ten thousand ether, uh, which at the time was worth about three million dollars. Okay, one final story. 
Uh, so these, this concerns what are called DEXs or decentralized exchanges. Uh, typically, the way a DEX works is you have an on-chain, what makes it an Ethereum-based or decentralized exchange uh, is the fact that there is a component of the exchange on Ethereum, which is a decentralized service. But if you operate fully 100% on Ethereum, it's very slow. And so what they tend to do is they tend to split functionality between something that's on-chain uh, and something that's off-chain that's just like a cloud infrastructure. So specifically what they'll do is they'll accept orders in the fast component and on the slow component, they'll settle the accounts and they'll accept ether and transfer ether out and, and things like that. Now, the other thing that they did is they decided that they saw a lot of high frequency trading on the off-chain order book. And one of the typical patterns of high frequency trading that's considered like not, not it's legal, but like people don't like it uh, is you submit a bunch of orders and then you cancel them uh, right away. And, uh, and so what they said is, we're gonna slow down the rate that, that you can cancel and we're gonna make you pay a fee to cancel your orders. So we're gonna force you, if you wanna cancel an order, you have to do it on chain, okay? So what happens is, let's say we have a trader, Alice, uh, she wants to buy a thousand useless Ethereum tokens. And so that gets uh, put in the order book. And the price of your useless Ethereum tokens plummets and she realizes, oh, I, I, I don't wanna buy a thousand anymore. That, that's a really bad deal. Uh, the price I'm willing to pay is, is way too high. I need to cancel that right away. And the problem is she has to cancel it on chain. So she has to send it to the Ethereum transaction uh, or sorry, to the Ethereum DAP. And remember Walter, well, Walter could be watching and he could see that she's trying to cancel this order. So then what Walter could do is he could think to himself, if she's trying to cancel it, then there's a chance that, that it's a bad deal for her if this order gets filled, otherwise she wouldn't be trying to cancel it. So what if I try to fill that order before she has a chance to, to cancel it? So what he'll do is he'll see that transaction while it's still pending before it's finalized. He'll fill out his own transaction uh, trying to fill that order and he'll give a really high gas price for it. And he's hoping that the miners will put his order into the block first, and then they'll put Alice's order in after, and now it's too late, it's already been filled. So she's trying to cancel an order that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, Walter is happy and, and Alice is sad. Okay, so those are three stories. And there is a common thread through these three stories. So the common thread is in Ethereum, because transactions uh, go to this sort of pending state before they're finalized, anyone who looks at the transaction pool, the unconfirmed transaction pool, they have access to privileged information. They can see what people are trying to do before they're actually able to do it. And there's enough time to squeeze in their own transactions in reaction to what other people are doing. And the way they can squeeze their transactions in uh, is if they're not a miner, uh, they can bribe the miners to include their transactions by paying high fees or quoting a high gas price. Uh, if they're an actual miner, then they control the order of the transactions, in, at least in the blocks that they create themselves. And so they can just order it any way that they want. They can put in transactions that nobody on the network has seen. Uh, they just drop them into the block in, in any order as possible. And so there was a nice terminology that came out of a paper that, that came out after ours at CCS. Uh, called minor extractable value. And so that the idea of, of MEV is it's the total amount of money that you could make by reordering transactions. And it, it sounds like it applies to miners. It's probably a, a not the best named uh, terminology, uh, but MEV could apply to just normal users as well who are just using high fees uh, in order to reorder things. But basically how much money are you able to squeeze out of uh, all the transactions that are sitting in the transaction pool by being able to reorder it, we call that MEV. And the idea is that you want to design your DAP so that you minimize MEV uh, as much as possible. So we call this front running and they're all examples of front running attacks, but they're not all quite the same. There seems to be like slight differences in the actual attacks themselves. So we thought, well, it might be useful to have a kind of taxonomy, a simple taxonomy for, for the different types of attacks. And so we came up with a taxonomy with three categories. Uh, so they're called displacement, insertion, and suppression. So the idea of displacement is 
you have a transaction that you want to be run and you want it to be run before some other transaction that you see uh, sitting on the blockchain in the pending transaction pool. Uh, you want it run before them, but you don't care whether that person runs their function or not after you, you're done running your function. So, for example, the, in Ethereum, there's a kind of domain name registration. It's not for domain names. It's for like Ethereum address, like address names. It's called Ethereum name service. Uh, but let's say that you see some, like Alan is, is going to register a really cool domain name and I see it and I want it. Even if I don't like it, I think, well, he's trying to register it, so it must be valuable to him. So what if I scoop it? And then once I scoop it, I can sell it back to him for maybe 10% more than what he paid for it. Um, and so you could, you could do that. And so what I would do is I try to squeeze my transaction in before his, and I don't care if his transaction runs because once his transaction runs, the domain's no longer available. So it's just going to fail anyways. The second kind of attack is insertion. So it's the same idea where you want to put a transaction, you know, into usually before the transaction that's getting run. There's there's a variant called sandwich where you put two transactions, one before and after. Uh, but you want to put a transaction in, but then you really want the original transaction to run. So, like for example, if you see a, a sell order, uh, you want to put your your buy order in first so it gets executed against that sell order. But if you putting your buy order in causes that sell order to disappear, then it's not useful to you. So you, you're targeting a specific transaction. You want to get a transaction in that, uh, like, will, will somehow like interact with that transaction. Um, so you, you, you care a lot that that, uh, other transaction is executed. Like I say, typically after your transaction, but sometimes you want to put your transaction right after it. It depends on the exact circumstance. So you see that a lot in, in like financial markets. And then the final kind of attack is suppression or block stuffing, where you see another transaction and you just want to delay it as long as possible. Uh, and so if there's an option, for example, uh, you might do a combo. So you might do a displacement attack where you get your bid in and then anyone else that tries to bid on the same good, you want to like delay them until the auction closes so that you're the lowest bidder. And all the other bids, then after the auction closes, all the other bids can come in and get processed, but it's too late because uh, the auction already closed. Uh, so that's called suppression. So in terms of our story, stories, uh, the status uh, ICO, here's some articles about it. Uh, and so this would be an example of a displacement attack. And then the FOMO 3D attack. I don't know if you call it an attack, but it was uh, something that someone did. Uh, it would be a suppression attack because you were trying to uh, try to stop other people from from buying the tickets. Okay, so what, another thing we did in the paper is we said how prevalent is front running, and so what we did is we tried to find like the most active. Well, we tried to find like the top DApps on Ethereum. Uh, and there was no like good measure of like what makes a DAP a top DAP. And so we ended up on the one measure that's at least objective is, well, which one has the most or the most user activity? Yeah, recently, like in the last week or something like that. And so there was a website that tracked this called DAP Radar. It still exists. And so as of September 2018, so once again, this is, you know, two and a half years ago, um, these, these are the uh, DAPs that were the most active uh, at that time. And we took the DAPs and we split them into categories and we found that there's actually really only four categories. So a bunch of them are exchange services. Uh, a bunch of them have to do with NFTs, uh, which you may have heard a, a lot about in the news because they sort of came back. Uh, but people buying and selling these tokens that represent a unique good. Uh, back then it was more of a game. They were making these crypto collectibles, whereas now it's like art and things like that. But anyways, you had your sort of NFT auction category. Uh, then you had games, uh, games like FOMO 3D, and then you had name services like Ethereum name service. And so we looked at at least one service in each of these four categories, the ones in gray, and we found if you, I won't go through the details, I talked about some of them, and for the other ones, you can go and look at the paper, but we found that there were front-running vulnerabilities in all of them. And so this led us to the hypothesis that front-running is, is very prevalent across Ethereum dApps. And it's also the reason we did the paper in the first place, because it's because we kept running into this issue uh, when we were trying to design our own systems. 
Uh, the one kind of thing that didn't show up on the list were ICOs. And ICOs are like really active when they're actually auctioning off tokens. And then once the auction is over, then they're not active at all. Uh, they, they might like trade tokens and things like that. Um, so because the week that we looked, there weren't ICOs. And by that time, ICOs had kind of fallen out of favor. They didn't really show up on the list. So we manually added that as a category as well to study as well. Okay, uh, finally, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about how do you prevent front running? What are the, the mitigations? And so uh, based on what we read anyways, and our own ideas, we find that there's basically three categories of mitigation that, that people are talking about. So uh, some way of sequencing transactions, some way of adding confidentiality, and some way to design your dApps to be resistant to front running. So the idea of transaction sequencing is uh, right now, currently on Ethereum, miners can arbitrarily order transactions. So they can put them in any order they want. Typically, they're going to pick the transactions that have the highest fees. What if somehow we handcuff them at the protocol level and say, actually, there, there's going to be some rules about how you have to include the transactions. So one rule that makes a lot of sense is what if you could do first in, first out? So the first transaction that is seen is the first transaction that's included. Now, this is hard on a distributed network because transactions propagate around the network. So different nodes will see different transactions in different orders. And so there's very recent work actually uh, on a way to take a consensus of basically across the network. If most of the network saw transaction A before transaction B, then transaction A will be included before B in the global ordering of transactions. Now, what I said is an approximation. It turns out it's it's really tricky to even write down like what that fairness criteria is or what that first in first out is in a distributed setting. And so you can see both this paper and there's another recent paper called Wendy, uh, and both of them struggle a lot with with coming up with what a definition of this would look like uh, but but eventually they do that's one of the main contributions of the papers and then uh, in the first case they they implement it as a consensus level protocol and in the second the idea is that you would have a third party and so the third party would be looking at the transactions and they would sequence them uh, according to some rule now this second uh, or the sequencing idea the idea of having a third party sequence transactions that has picked up steam more recently. There's also in parallel has nothing to do with fairness, but in parallel, there's a lot of interest in what's called layer two uh, solutions on Ethereum where uh, because Ethereum is so slow, you try and process transactions off chain. And when you do this process of L2, you have a chance to stick a sequencer in. It's, it's, it's in the logical flow of what you're doing anyways uh, with layer two. So if none of that makes sense to you, it doesn't matter. But if you study Ethereum, uh, you can think about sequencing becoming popular because it's being driven by L2 uh, solutions. But anyways, you could have a third party that's going to sequence transactions. Uh, Chainlink is is another service that provides oracles. So those are services. It's a distributed network of nodes that bring real world data onto the blockchain. And since they have this distributed network anyways, they thought, well, what if we add a service where they can do sequencing for you if if you want? Uh, and we'll we'll sort of take a consensus of these nodes in terms of what what transactions they saw first. Uh, the final thing you could do is you could try to not impose an order and just randomly order things. So you could take the transactions and you could apply some pseudo random function to them, and then that could dictate the order of the transactions. Now, this doesn't solve all front, front running issues. You can sort of spray like the, the, the block with a whole bunch of orders and then kind of cancel the orders that you don't want to be executed. And there, like, anyways, you can see the paper. There's a lot of nuance for whether this works or not. There is one kind of fringe variant of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Cash ABC. And it implements a rule like this. And recently, there's a new cryptographic primitive called verifiable delay functions. And there's a lot of talk or chatter about uh, using VDS uh, so that transactions are inserted randomly. The next thing you could do is you could try to make it so that people can't see what's going on. So the main problem is because the transactions are visible, then you can front run them because you know what other people are trying to do. So what if when they're sitting in the pen pending pool, they're encrypted or somehow obfuscated so that, that people don't know what it is that you're trying to do. So this is a nice idea. It requires a little nuance in terms of what confidentiality means 
because there's different aspects of a decentralized app that you might want to protect. So uh, you have to ask yourself, okay, am I protecting the code of the DAP? Is it like the current state of the DAP? Is it the functions that are being run? And if it's the functions that are being run, is it the name of the function and the parameters, or is it just the parameters? Uh, is it an anonymous thing? So like, for example, I might see that one person is interacting with a, um, a well-known exchange, and I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're buying. I don't know if they're selling. I don't know what price they're doing. But I know because like side information that they're a short seller. And so when I see them start hammering uh, this exchange service, I think, oh, they're short selling something. And then that's some partial information that might be useful to me. So uh, adding anonymity would be would be another aspect of it. So there is no solution that I know of, even in the literature, let alone implemented, that does like one, two, six uh, confidentiality. There is a little bit of research that's trickling out. Uh, it, it ends up being really complicated, and so it's coming a little slowly. Uh, but but there are some research projects that provide two, three, four uh, confidentiality. So Hawk and Akaiden are, are two examples of systems like this. And there's also a, a primitive that sometimes you implement at the DAP layer, which is you commit first to the transaction that you want to do, but you don't tell the DAP what it is that you want to do. And then the DAP sequences it. It says, okay, I saw the committed transactions in this order. And then now that the order is locked, everyone reveals what the transactions are. And so this could be applied at, at the very least at the level of, of hiding the parameters to the function, uh, but you could also hide the name of the function as well. And sometimes what you're doing moves money and that gets a little complicated uh, because you want to make sure that that when you reveal the transaction, the money is there to be moved. Uh, so someone could kind of cancel a transaction by making sure the money's not available anymore. And so there's a fancy way of doing this called submarine commitments, and you can see the paper or, or read about it online uh, that 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 sort of enhances the space. Uh, that that yeah, it provides three four confidentiality with some enhancements. The final thing that you can do is you can try and redesign your DAP from the bottom up so that transaction ordering just isn't a relevant issue. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. So let's say you want to do a, a, an order book. Um, so as we saw, if, if you have buy and sell orders and they're sitting there and people execute against the orders that are in the book, there's a lot of room uh, for front running attacks. Uh, but what you could do instead is you could implement, instead of an order book, you could implement what's called a call market. And a call market works more like an auction. So people put their, their bids and their, their offers uh, into the book, but they don't get executed right away. They don't get instantly executed. They sit there for a window of time. And then at the end of the window of time, all the, the uh, trades get executed against each other. And so it doesn't matter. It just matters whether your trade's in the book or not. It doesn't matter whether it was first or last. Uh, so it removes all sensitivity to time. So call markets are used by every like New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. Uh, most people don't realize it, but but they're used actually. NASDAQ will run two markets at the same time. They'll have a continuous time market and they'll have a call market that runs throughout the day. And the call market uh, is closes at the end of market day and it, it dictates, dictates the uh, closing price of a particular asset. Anyways, we implemented a call market in a recent paper, which you can find on my website, or if you just Google it. Um, and so, yeah, we, we did a lot of work to try and eliminate front running attacks. Uh, another thing that's popular on Ethereum are tokens. Tokens have a standard, an interface that defines the functions that um, tokens should implement so that they work out of the box with generic wallet software or exchange services and things like that. And so the standard that's that's the most common is called ERC-20. And ERC-20 is vulnerable to a particular front-running attack called the multiple withdraw attack. And so we have another paper that that talks about that attack and how you could fix it and uh, by redesigning uh, basically ERC-20 so it's not vulnerable. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we found that front-running is pervasive. So all sorts of different categories of dApps have issues that look like front-running. Uh, initially, we want to increase awareness of these types of attacks, but now I would say that, that people are well aware of these kinds of attacks, and we're still waiting on good generic solutions, especially for confidentiality at the blockchain level. I think that that would be a very important contribution where it's complicated, so it's slow, but there's still a lot of work uh, to be done in, in that space. 
Uh, so that's it. I'll uh, take questions. Thank you. And you can ask me questions, anything blockchain as well, if, if you don't have a specific question about this specific uh, research. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, I was just wondering what is your, um, if you don't mind saying, like your prediction on how high Ethereum will be by the end of the year? Like your price sure. prediction? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually, I'll, I'll decline to make a prediction. And uh, the reason is, I don't think that anyone has a good model of how Ethereum price behaves. Uh, I think it's largely driven by speculation. And mm -hmm. so uh, it, it's hard to, it's not like a stock where you can say, okay, this company has a specific book value. It's been audited by a financial auditor. And so at the very least, if you divide this amount of money, you know, their assets minus their liabilities up a million ways for every shareholder. This is the number that you arrive at. But with Ethereum, you have no book value. And so no one can tell you whether it should be worth $3 or $30,000 or $300,000. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I have no idea. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question too. I've mm -hmm. heard, um, about the EIP one five five nine, is yeah. that also to um like uh stop the um the ways of like cheating the system that you're mentioning? So it's not is that that do that? yeah, it's not specifically targeted at front running. Uh, it makes some other changes, and it's sort of it's very controversial about whether the miners want to adapt it or not, and so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not clear whether it will be adopted, but I don't have a prediction on that either, but it's, it's fun to watch the debate. What are your current research plans in the blockchain area? So we do a lot of financial services. So we like actually building systems. So like we built the order book, uh, we're trying to add confidentiality to it now. And uh, we like playing with off-chain solutions to increase scalability. So a lot of engineering work. Uh, we did a recent project where we implemented a multi-party computation as a service uh, using Ethereum. And so those are the main things. Uh, the other area that I'm interested in, I think a lot of people in this space are interested in is uh, the prospect of a central bank issuing a digital currency. Uh, so these are called CBDC, central bank digital currencies. Uh, the Fed in the U.S. and the Bank of Canada are considering it. They've, you know, written a lot of papers about the pros and cons of doing it and thinking about how it should look, particularly from a privacy perspective. And could you use crypto to enforce some level of privacy? I think that's a, a really interesting question. That's one thing that that I'm hoping to get funding uh, soon to to work on. Uh, hello, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a question to ask. Yeah. Uh, what's the current uh, status of the legislation over these cases that you talked about? If it happens today, this kind of uh, front running attacks, uh, is there any law or it, it is, has it been criminalized? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it hasn't been criminalized at this point. Uh, I think a lot of the reasons, first off, it's, it's, it's okay. It's valid to do front running attacks in terms of the protocol itself. The protocol allows it, right? So if the protocol has a door and it's sort of like, oh, you shouldn't open the door, but you could open it and there's no lock on the door. It's not really clear whether it's illegal or not. Um, now you could argue that some of the uh, trading strategies and things that have been deemed illegal by like the SEC and, and the CFTC also were allowed by the system. And so, um, Anyways, it, it, it's hard to, to like draw lines in the sand in terms of what's criminal and what's not criminal. Uh, so that's one challenge. Another challenge is jurisdiction. So a lot of this happens anonymously. So you don't know who these participants are. Like the person who won FOMO 3D, no one knows who they are. They don't know where in the world they are. Uh, and so even if you wanted to do some enforcement against them, you have to find them. And then you have to figure out whether the country they're in has some sort of action that's, that's possible. Um, so if there were, 
if it was like an institutional case where like well identified parties did this kind of thing, uh, then it might rise to the level of consideration by the security regulators. In fact, I, I imagine it would, uh, and then you might see some some regulatory action. But to date, we haven't seen anything. Okay, thank you. Hello. So, uh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in terms of anonymity, right? So you said about the person who won the formal 3D game, right? Nobody knows who they are. So, is it is it possible like to track maybe like at least get the address of the person, uh, but maybe not the identity or something like? Because it just seems to me like I keep hearing about some of these like um, uh, cyber attacks and it asks people to pay Bitcoin, and I'm always worried because I'm like. If it continues and it, you know, people could do all kinds of things and perhaps blackmail governments or things like that. You know, so I don't know what's the possibility if you, there's somebody's really determined or the government is really determined to track you down. Right? Sure, sure. How possible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what's the anonymity? Anonymity level of Ethereum, and we know the government's interested in this. And I've yes. talked to law enforcement, and I. Yeah, we sort of know like how they approach uh, this particular problem. So, like you say, every uh, Ethereum transaction has an address that's associated with it. Address means like some cryptographic identifier that I just created on my computer. And if I have multiple identifiers and I kind of mix my money across them, then it's possible to cluster them together. So. If I have one address that I only use for my illicit things and another thing I use for regular things, if my wallet ever decides to mix that money together, it doesn't know that I'm trying to separate them, then it could easily get clustered together and you would figure out, oh, the person that owns this address is also the person that owns this other address. Um, so that's the first approach. So you go, you look at the addresses, you try and cluster together the sets of addresses and figure out who they are. Then if you ever just once, like say I buy something and it gets mailed to me, now there's a business service that knows my real name, my address associated with that address. And if that address is clustered with my other addresses, then you could link those things together uh, to my real identity. And so there's uh, companies that go around and, or let's say I post online and I'm like, you know, on Twitter, I'm like, if you want to send a donation because I wrote a really cool article, you know, send it to this Bitcoin address, right? And so there's companies that scrape the web and they buy stuff from like different companies or use different exchange services to figure out what their addresses are. And then they run these clustering algorithms to, to try and uh, try to mark as much of the blockchain as they can. Uh, so that's what law enforcement will pay for. They'll pay for a subscription like that. The other way anonymity can be broken is every transaction has to come from a computer. Computer has an IP address and your ISP knows the link between your IP address and your, uh, and your real identity. And so if, uh, law enforcement is running a node on a blockchain and they receive uh, the transaction requests directly from you. It's not relayed to them from someone else on the network. It's given to them directly. Then they could know your IP address. Um, and it's even worse if you use a mobile phone where you're not, um, where you're not, uh, you're not directly downloading all the transactions to pay attention to what your balance is. Uh, mobile phones aren't capable of doing it. So they use another protocol. It's called SPV. And at least in Bitcoin, it's called SPV. And you kind of have a server and you kind of tell the server what addresses you're interested in having monitored. And then they're going to monitor it on your behalf. So even if you're not sending any transactions, but you have this Bitcoin address and you connect to one of the servers and your wallet says, oh, like this is an address that I want tracked, uh, then that server could figure out who you are. Um, now, there is some privacy around those things. There's, it uses this thing called bloom filters, but then there's some like bad implementations that, that basically lose all the privacy provisions. So it's kind of a nuanced tale about how effective that is, but you can de-anonymize that people that way. So basically you can link transactions together and maybe link it to real world transactions. Uh, you can see IP addresses and then uh, if people use SPV, you could maybe use that as, as another mechanism. So at the end of the day, it's it's we call it pseudonymous. So it's 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 not like the banking system where every transaction has your name on it. But at the same time, it's not like cash where it's completely anonymous either. It's somewhere in the middle. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, it means that um, 
you, you, the shortest way to like track somebody down is by trying to see if there's an IP address attached to um, a transaction or an address or something like that, because I could easily just create a new um, wallet with new address, a new address for any legal transaction or any, you know, bad transaction or criminal transaction I'm trying to do and use it for only that, that and only that, and then disappear, right? So yeah. The, yeah. So I was just thinking if, if maybe perhaps the IP address thing could be the best to show, but what if you use something like a VPN or something to like, Obfuscate. Yeah, yeah. So you could use Tor. Uh, so Tor is is the main. It's like VPN plus uh, mm -hmm. that would obfuscate your your identity. And a lot of services, illicit services, use kind of Tor in reverse. So they have Tor hidden services that let, lets you put up a server uh, without disclosing the IP address of the server. So like Silk Road and different uh, services that sold illicit goods, they ran uh, using Tor. So so yeah, the the problem with the IP address is yeah, a someone could be using Tor. And then B, and we don't know if law enforcement can break Tor. So there is some evidence that they can because they keep taking down these Silk Road copycats, even though they're on Tor. And there was this big controversy about like uh, a like kind of private research group within CMU that that like somehow they they there's speculation that they somehow broke Tor, at least the hidden services, and are collaborating with law enforcement to break it. But anyways, no one no one knows what the law force enforcement capabilities are with regards to Tor. But, but Tor could uh, be one of the obstacles. And the other thing about the IP address is you have to be online when they send the transaction. So if you learn about it a year later, because you're doing your investigation, it's too late. Uh, so the Bitcoin addressing, you can always do, you can do retrospectively, uh, but uh, unless if you have a node that's monitoring this all the time, uh, then, and it's not clear whether law enforcement can legally do that, like snoop on every transaction if they don't have probable cause. Um, like just do a dragnet surveillance of the entire blockchain. I, I don't know the legal implications of that either, but it was, it, it's an interesting problem uh, to work on. Yeah, because I'm always worried about like balancing privacy and abuse. Um, I'm always worried about that. Like how do you ensure privacy but without it being abused? Because if you have ultimate privacy, people, bad actors will come in and abuse the system and give it a bad name. Right. So I'm always worried about that. How do you balance those two together? Yeah, exactly. So so that is uh um that's also yeah, it's it's a concern that that predates Bitcoin. So like lots of privacy people have written long, long, you know, philosophical discussions of, of that topic and where you find the balance. And I, I think it's up to individuals. Individuals have different opinions on on where they fall on that spectrum. But it's it's good to definitely be aware of and, and to understand the consequences of of what you're doing and what your technology could be capable of, both good and bad. Okay, sorry, one last question, something else. Yeah. Um, so you talked about on-chain and off-chain transactions. So my guess would be the kind of transactions you move off-chain are, chain, are transactions that could considerably, or the execution, or maybe some smart contract or something could considerably be slower um, and so make not make you know, so I'm just asking, do you have any suggestions or best tips or advice or best practices as to what kind of if you want to perform a transaction on a blockchain, what kind of transaction do you want to move off chain as opposed to on chain? As in like if you want if you had to like um try to reduce the amount of time it would take to execute the transaction. Sure, sure. Yeah, so what you'll do is first off, it, you'll find the answer yourself. So the way we do it in our lab is we always implement on chain first, even if we have to simulate it because Ethereum can't handle it. And then we understand where, like, what it is that consumes a lot of gas or consumes a lot of memory. And Ethereum's a little weird in terms of how expensive it is because, like, you pay through the nose if you try and store a lot of information. If you do computation, it's also expensive, but like storage is, is even worse. Uh, but then there's like refunds, like if you free up storage, you get some of your gas back. And so it ends up being like, like, you can't really predict. It's hard to predict ahead of time, like what, what's going to consume a lot of gas and what's not. And generally, if you're going to go off chain. Um, okay, so there's the DEX solution where you move some components on chain and the expensive ones off chain. Uh, but then you're trusting the off chain component. Now, the approach is, could we move things off chain, but you don't have to trust them. Is there a way to do that? And so that's what we call L2 or layer two. And so there's a couple of different ways that you can move things off chain where you still get 
close to the security assumptions uh, that you get from L1. Um, uh, yeah, so so anyway, so the, the main techno technique is called rollups. And so uh, one simple way is you could have someone execute it off chain and create a proof that they executed it correctly. And if verifying that proof takes less time than redoing the computation, then you can tell all the miners, give all the miners the proof instead, and then they just verify that the proof is right. Uh, so these are called ZK rollups, zero knowledge rollups, and they use a technology called SNARKs. Uh, and uh, it turns out that that you could do it that way. And then there's another nice solution called uh, there's two. There's one called Optimism and one called Arbitrum, where you have servers and they're sort of incentivized to compute things right. And if they ever uh, compute something wrong, someone else can come along. They can point out that they're wrong. You can use Ethereum to settle the dispute, and then you get paid if you correctly dispute one of these servers uh, doing something wrong. Uh, so the Arbitrum project is from people at Princeton, uh, like Ed Felton uh, and, and other people who have long research histories. And, and that's a project that I really like, and it's the project that we used in our most recent work uh, in order to scale things. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy. It was a very um, stimulating talk. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure. In uh, two weeks, we will return at which time um, uh, we will present a UMBC project on the Meeting Mayhem game, which is a game to develop adversarial thinking in a network context. So thank you again, and um, that concludes today's CDL. All right, thanks.